Extra Historians, welcome to Lies, the part of the show where we tell you all the things we got wrong, all the stuff we left out, and all the emperors we czarred. I'm Rob Rath, I'm the head writer of Extra History, and uh, we're here to talk about Grigory Rasputin, a series that I loved writing and uh, you folks seem to enjoy watching. Uh, I just want to say first thanks to our patrons on Patreon, you make lies possible, and uh, let's jump into some recommended reading. Rasputin, Faith, Power, and the Twilight of the Romanovs by Douglas Smith. This was my favorite of the books. It really does a great job of dealing with Rasputin as a media figure, sorting truth from fiction, and uh, also describing the religious background of Europe at this time. Uh, the Rasputin File by Edvard Redzinki, which really centers around the transcripts we talked about of the Provisional Government's investigation of Rasputin. Uh, also a good book. The Romanovs by Robert K. Massey, which is a good background on the family and all their foibles and their record of how they made very bad decisions often regarding the fate of Russia. Uh, I also just want to mention this book called Hitler's Monsters, A Supernatural History of the Third Reich. The early chapters do a really good job of describing this turn toward occultism before World War I, and it's more talking about Europe in general than, than Russia specifically. But it's a really good frame for understanding where Rasputin comes from, not even just in a Russian context, but like in a general European context. I just want to mention that we are part of the Nebula Network. You can see a exclusive video on Tipu Sultan, which is going to pair with our Conquest of India series that's coming out soon. They're associated with Curiosity Stream. They have a really good three-part documentary called Empire of the Tsars, which tracks the Romanovs from 1613 to 1917. And uh, that'll make a good, good viewing uh, for, for pairing up with this one. And I just, for a general question, uh, someone went, asked us about the uh, nickname of the Mad Monk, which we used for our first episode. This is actually Iliodor's nickname, which gradually sort of migrated to being about Rasputin. There's uh, even a Hammer horror film, Rasputin the Mad Monk. Uh, so uh, just so you know, that's actually not Rasputin's nickname, it's Iliodor's, but for some reason it, it got uh, put on Rasputin, who's not a monk, who's not a formal religious figure of any kind. And I want to just talk about the Romanovs and a, a sort of weird relationship I have with them, which is I don't like the Romanovs. I don't like Nicholas and Alexandra. I think that uh, they made extremely poor decisions. Uh, they were really unrepentant autocrats. You know, when, when Nicholas becomes czar, he actually takes an oath that he is not going to let go of any of his autocratic power. This was like a thing with him and his family. And Alexandra is behind him every step of the way. She backs many of his worst decisions. So she's very much part of this problem too. Um, I, I think that they were bad leaders that caused a lot of human misery. They also were, were pretty bad on anti-Semitism and Jewish issues, you know. They outwardly were like, oh, these pogroms are terrible, but inwardly they're like, but they're really good for nationalism, you know. Um, but I do want to say, though I think they're jerks who made really bad decisions, when it comes to their family dynamic, I have a hard time not empathizing with them. Nicholas was a very good father overall, though <laughs> he was very much raising Alexei to be a, um, a, a future autocrat. Again, his words, you know, Alexei would like shout orders at soldiers that were around him and be like, look, that's a little autocrat. as like a cute thing. Um, which just made him harder to control when he was injuring himself all the time. Um, but I do really empathize, empathize with them with the fact that they really loved their kids. And uh, I, I have a two-year-old that had to go through major surgery this year. She's fine. But I literally went through that and then started reading for this series. And I very much was in the headspace of like, man, this would be so, so hard to see your kid go through. Just the, all the stuff with Alexi is just horrible. And I don't really blame them for their association with Rasputin as far as that, because I do really understand that particularly not having medical science totally behind you in, in, in that context, I understand how they could, you know, fall into Rasputin's sway. And for the record, I personally think Rasputin was religiously sincere and believed that he was helping Alexei, I don't think he was like totally a charlatan. I think he took advantage of his position. But um, yeah, I, I felt so much sympathy and empathy with them in, in, in that situation um, because it was really hard to go through even not having my kid be that seriously sick. 
Let's move on to episode one, patron question from Daniel Gogano. I'd always heard Rasputin had left his village in exile after being caught committing a crime. Is that true or myth? It's a myth. This would have shown up in records. Uh, there's this real need for Rasputin's enemies to tie him to some kind of criminal past in Pokrovska, which just like does not exist. Uh, we would have records of it because we have records of more minor stuff he did. Um, and they, they, uh, the police go down there and really make a big investigation out of like trying to find something and they just don't. They especially really wanted him to be tied to horse theft, which was a big crime back then. It would have left some kind of evidence. Also, the name Rasputin has this like etymological link to like scoundrel or criminal or thief. So this was another way people were like, see, his name is Rasputin. So clearly his family are scoundrels. Um, and actually one of the first signs of Romanov favor is they allow him to change his name to uh, Rasputin Novi, which basically means Rasputin New or New Rasputin. And it's partially like as a way to break with this uh, linguistic tie that's causing him some problems. Uh, it's a little too, too involved to explain in an episode. Patreon question from Aaron Walker. What happened to Rasputin's kids? Great question. Oh, this is a great one. His son Dmitri died in Moscow in 1937. He didn't get out after the revolution. His daughter Vivara, who was the youngest one, died in 1925 in Moscow. Same reason, both from illness. Maria Rasputin actually managed to escape to Paris with her husband, who is... That's a whole other thing. He was also like an occult figure in the Romanov circle, um, who was a straight-up con man. Um, I don't personally think Rasputin was really a con man, but this guy definitely was. Uh, he took a bunch of money from aristocrats saying he was going to get the Romanovs out of Russia and then never delivered, never even tried to deliver. So they make it to Paris. Uh, he dies, and she ends up having to become a cabaret dancer to support her daughter, and then ends up like working in the circus as a lion tamer and doing like um, trick shows with ponies, and goes to the United States and, and ends up setting, settling in Los Angeles where she dies in 1977. But what's really, really sad about Maria Rasputin um, is that a lot of her career, her performing career, is predicated around her father and reenacting his murder. Like she's dancing in this cabaret while people are reenacting the murder of, of Rasputin, which was terribly traumatic for her. Um, she wrote a couple books on her father as well that were kind of a, a, a way to, to answer uh, Iliador and Yusupov's book. Um, so yeah, she, it's quite sad, actually. She's also mauled by a bear at one point, apparently. Um, so some other characters. Let's just talk about some of the others. Iliador, uh, or Sergei Trufanov, as he changes his name after he uh, abandons the priesthood, he flees to Norway, then New York. He makes a big apology to the Jewish community because he, you know, had a, a part in whipping up anti-Jewish sentiment in Russia. Um, he acted as himself in a silent film about Rasputin that's now lost, uh, sadly. Uh, he went back to Russia in 1918 to get in good with Lenin and the Bolsheviks, ended up going back to New York in 1922, and lives until 1952 in New York as a longtime janitor uh, at, at a building there. Yeah, so he gets to live a long, healthy life, despite all the awful things he did. Theophan escaped with the White Army. He eventually becomes a hermit in France, and he dies there in 1940, a few months before the Germans invade. Hermogenes does not survive the revolution. Uh, he is drowned by the Bolsheviks, and uh, in 1999, he's canonized as a martyr in the Eastern Orthodox Church. Speaking of him, though, there were some questions about uh, the possible castration of uh, Bishop Hermogenes and where that story comes from, whether it's propaganda or not. So this... We said that it was alleged. We didn't say it was definitely a thing. Uh, he had a very high voice, kind of like a lot of these people who, who, who practiced um, self-castration did. Uh, apparently, as a student, he was very interested in the ideas of the Skopsi, which were this sect that I'm not going to go into the gory details about it, but they believed that uh, self-castration uh, and self-mastectomies were a way to control carnal lust and that this was a way to get rid of original sin. Um, he seems to have played with or been influenced by these ideas early on. This was a sect that was suppressed. Uh, they were related to the Klisti, who we'll talk about uh, uh, later. And he, so he would have hidden this if this was something that happened. It also could have been a vicious rumor. Um, but this sort of like is a shorthand for like, 
he's pretty committed. Um, also, he's like all of these guys are a member of the Black Hundreds, which is this right wing um, organization. There was some splitting hairs on the term czar and uh, emperor and differences between uh, emperor and czar. So czar is a derivative of Caesar. So the Russian Empire becomes another one like the Byzantines, the Ottomans, the Holy Roman Empire, who are trying to like take the mantle of Rome. Right. And uh, so it's around, but it's more like a, like a title like king. Emperor is, is a higher title, so when and Catherine uh, grabs Poland, she's like the Tsar of Poland, but the Empress of, of the Russian Empire. Um, often they're kind of like used interchangeably uh, by the early 20th century. I just decided to do that to avoid word repetition. Episode 2, patron question from Luna. How much of the anti-Rasputin propaganda came from aristocrats resentful that a peasant had such sway with the royal family, or fearful that Rasputin's rise was a herald of the destruction of the social order post-abolition of serfdom? So a lot of it starts that way as, as aristocratic rumor. And I, one thing I really like about Douglas Smith's book is it makes the tie between the previous uh, aristocratic scuttlebutt about uh, a lesbian affair between Alexandra and uh, uh, Anna Virabova, who becomes one of Rasputin's big uh, uh, proponents at the court, big boosters. And um, it just points out that like this kind of like these rumors swirling around were present before Rasputin's arrival, and he's just like a new element they glom onto. YouTube questions. We draw Rasputin <laughs> giving the sign of the cross from left to right, but as Orthodox would have it, this should be right to left. Why I laugh is because that frame, we went through multiple versions because originally he's giving the blessing like this, which is a big problem if you know about Russian history because that's what the old believers do. There's this schism in the Russian church, or in the uh, Eastern Orthodox Church, that we will cover at some point because it's just amazing to understand that people were like jailed and beaten over this question. So there is this reform movement that involves several different changes to wording, but also like how you hold your hand when you bless someone. Um, and uh, the old believers, this, this, group that decides that they're going to hold on to these traditions are really horribly oppressed over these things that when you look at them in a modern context, you're like, why would you go to jail over that? You know, holding your, your hand like this or rather than, you know, like this when you're blessing. So we went through all these versions because also our characters all have four fingers, three fingers and a thumb. So actually getting these hands like, uh. so we were really focused on like trying to figure out how to translate this to four fingers and, and missed the uh, directional. Uh, but at some point we'll cover the old believers because it's really fascinating. A lot of folks were unaware of a, a word we used to describe Rasputin in episodes two and three, Eccleist. So this, this is the religious group that he was accused of being a part of. We talked about it in episode one. I probably should have repeated just like a line of the banned and suppressed religious group that Rasputin was rumored to be a, a, a member of. Um, but I was trying to cut down word count since we knew this was going to be a four episode, so I could go on paternity leave. Um, but this caused some confusion between episodes. For what it's worth, a lot of the things the Cleists were, uh, or, or Cleisty were, were accused of sound like very bog standard witch trial, like early Christianity and the Roman Empire stuff. Like they have big orgies and they do bad things to children and they, you know, practice like self-mortification like some of which might be true some of which might be made up really most of what we know about them comes from uh the from government oppression so like we don't know how much to really trust that but supposedly they would like have these big orgies to like discharge sin in a ritualized environment so that you didn't want to sin anymore after that but again like this is something that you hear about other suppressed religious groups. It just seems to be like a, an echo that travels down through history. So who knows? Uh, episode three, uh, question from YouTube. Some people were curious if Rasputin was popular amongst the people for his anti-war position or not. As far as I saw, not really. A lot of that lobbying is uh, at the elite level. It's behind closed doors. He does make some statements, but war is pretty popular, um, you know, both in the first Balkan war and, and in the beginning in World War I. Uh, also, his reputation is pretty bad by that point. 
And uh, he changed position really quickly as soon as Russia was in World War I. He was like, okay, well, I didn't want us to be here, but now that we're here, we got to win. Um, so he really gets behind the war effort. He uh, writes letters and, and visits troops. He really uh, uh, gets the, the older Romanov women to uh, go be Red Cross nurses. He majorly encourages them to do that. So he pivots really quickly as well. So in public, you don't necessarily see this, like him as this big, big uh, advocate for peace. Was the gray-bearded Duma member with glasses Alexander Guchkov? Yes, he is indeed. Uh, as speaker and chairman of the state Duma, he's a major uh, Rasputin opponent, and he's the leader of the delegation that has the big rift with Alexander over, um, or Nicholas, uh, over his uh, uh, suppressing of newspaper reports about Rasputin. So people also pointed out how absurd it is that people would blame Rasputin for the uh, assassination of Prime Minister Stolypin. He was hated. <laughs> And he was really well known for using force to put down uh, uh, uprisings to the point that a noose was known as Stolypin's necktie uh, in, in local slang. Um, yeah, we didn't get into it. He had a lot of, Stolypin had a lot of, uh, his big effort was uh, agrarian reform and taking away these kind of communal peasant holdings and, and turning them into private property. Uh, and I just want to point out that Stolypin's assassin was an Okhrana, a Russian secret, a Tsar's secret police informant. So there's always been this like other conspiracy theory that the Okhrana had him killed. Uh, we didn't get too much into the Okhrana and like the whole thing, but anything you imagine the KGB doing, like the Okhrana are doing first, like the Tsar's secret police are doing already, to the point that like one of the big reforms in 1905 is like you can't read everyone's mail anymore. Like that's one of the big like things of like. Don't read everyone's mail all the time. And it's so bad that Alexandra actually like has code words in her mail that she, when she writes letters to family members, because she knows the secret police are reading her mail too. Like that's how ubiquitous this is. Episode four, patron question from Brian. Uh, he wanted to hear a lot more about the final 18 months of Nicholas's reign. I'm going to take a buy on this actually, because we might do a series on that in the future. I do want to say that there's this sort of ridiculous, like it's really sad because of how it turns out, but like when the Romanovs are arrested, there is just this assumption all around Europe and even within Russia that like, okay, Nicholas is probably gonna get executed. Alexandra is likely gonna get executed, but the kids will be fine. Like they're blameless. Like what are they gonna do to them? And as a result of this, there's not as much impetus in like saving them. So at one point, because the, the provisional government like doesn't know what to do with the, the Romanovs, basically. So at, there's a point where they just like, they approach the King of England, who's Nicholas's cousin, and are, and are like, hey, do you want the Romanovs? Can we just like ship you all the Romanov kids and they just live with you? And like, they're just out of our hands. And the, the, the British monarchy says no, because they were already kind of feeling very unstable after World War I, and socialist ideas were very popular at the time in the UK. And everyone's on the side of the revolutionaries at this point. And uh, the, the royal advisor is just like, absolutely not. You cannot be shown having any sympathy for the Romanovs at this point. And, you know, the sad part of this is like, as a result, like they all get murdered. You know, which is absolutely terrible and just murdered in the worst way you could possibly imagine, too. And, um, like, to the point where the Bolsheviks actually lie about it for a while. They're like, oh, Alexei is fine, and we put the sisters on a train, and we don't know where they are. Which is why you get all these rumors that, you know, that Anastasia is somewhere out there for a while. Another YouTube question. We had all these comments that it was possible that the the... Poisoned cakes didn't affect Rasputin because sugar is a neutralizing agent, so if you give him cyanide and sugar at the same time, it's just going to equal it out. Or that Rasputin's liver was just so gone with cirrhosis that it couldn't absorb the cyanide. Uh, I went with the idea that it wasn't cyanide because I, I just think that's the most likely Occam's razor explanation. Um, but I do want to point out, it's hard to kill someone with poison. Like, People think it's really easy, but like the dosage is very difficult to get right. The, uh, what you serve it with, like, like we just discussed, uh, it tends to like take more 
And also it depends how fast someone eats because someone might eat slowly and then they get sick and they don't want to eat anymore. So like, who knows? They also could have just messed it up. Um, and the same thing with getting shot, like movies and TV and at this time plays would have you think that if you shoot someone, they just die. But, you know, you could conceivably shoot someone through the body and it doesn't hit anything particularly vital and they just pass out from shock and then wake up when you're trying to move their body. So I, you know, Lincoln was shot in the head from point blank range with an enormous bullet and he's still talking, you know, for a little bit afterwards and kind of like moving around. Um, so yeah, it's, it really to me comes down to the fact because there are a bunch of drunk aristocratic flunkies trying to kill someone they've never done it before. Someone asks, the stories talk about Rasputin having undue influence over the royal family, but our series shows Nicholas mostly ignoring Rasputin's advice. Are there any specific incidents? So Rasputin doesn't necessarily give specific policy instructions. Like the, the thing with the, um, uh, delaying the draft was unusual in that. Um, it's mostly, he says stuff like, make them remember who is emperor. Basically like, throw your weight around. Like, you should be more assertive. Or, you know, please don't go close to the front and to headquarters. You know, you, sh you really need it at home with the pal at the palace with Alexandra. Like that kind of stuff. It's not necessarily things he should do, but how he should do things. Um, the specific policy stuff he manages to enact is through Alexandra, and it has to do with appointing and removing people that are hostile to him. And that's, that's kind of it. I just want to say, coming up on Extra History, the conquest of India with Bob Whitaker, Japanese militarism, I just finished that one up. It's really fascinating. The Empire of Brazil, where I just, I just started writing, that's where the Portuguese monarchy, uh, Portugal gets invaded by Napoleon, and the monarchy just decides to go to Brazil for a couple generations. And we are now collecting topics on object history. So if you liked our History of Coffee uh, episodes, we're going to do something like that. And always keep an eye out. You never know when we're going to drop a sponsored episode or a whole series. Wasn't So you haven't read Cool? I don't know what we're going to do next. I don't have any hint or idea, and I'm not going to tell you. This stuff is awful. I love it, but it's terrible. I walked like everywhere in the US like to find it, and then I found it in Hong Kong uh, just to use a prop for this video. I don't know what I'm gonna do with the rest of it, except maybe eat it, because it's wonderful and terrible. Um, I'm gonna drink some water. All right, let's get into Ibn Battuta's side trip where we talk about Prince Felix Yusupov. Fascinating, fascinating character. We talk about his theatricality, he had this really love, big love for play acting through his whole life, including like as a kid, he would dress up as like a very stereotypical like Eastern Sultan and like beat servants, you know, who weren't doing what he was like as part of the game, including one guy they had to save him. Like they were worried he was going to die because Yusupov was hitting him so hard. Um, he also, he was probably by or, you know, he was somewhere on the LGBT, you know, spectrum. And, um, he did a lot of uh, dressing up in his mother's clothes as a teenager and going around St. Petersburg and, and like flirting with, with young Russian officers. So, but the point is like, he was really into like dressing up in costumes and performing and like pretending to be someone else. This is like a major theme in his life. So when he then goes on to like write this book and like where he's this central figure in world history, you can definitely see that psychology at play. But interestingly, he has a, a film legacy, uh, which is in 1932, MGM put out a highly sensationalized film called Rasputin and the Empress, where two of the lead characters are based on Yusupov and his wife. Side so note that Yusupov character is played by John Barrymore from the Barrymore acting dynasty. Rasputin is played by Lionel Barrymore, and Alexandra is played by Ethel Barrymore, because that's a thing that used to happen in Hollywood. Anyway, the Yusupovs are absolutely livid about this movie, not because Yusupov has shown killing Rasputin, which he loved and he loved being recognized for, but his wife is shown b being like one of Rasputin's followers and also he like hypnotizes her, literally hypnotizes her and like takes advantage of her. So they hate this and they sue MGM in English courts where it's easier to prove libel. And they win this massive settlement, like the in-court settlement is around $2.5 million today and apparently there's a huge out-of-court one as well. And as a result, every American movie started putting a disclaimer 
at the end of every film, it says this story of this story, all names, characters, and incidents portrayed in this pr production are fictitious. No identification with actual persons, living or deceased, places, buildings, and products is intended or should be inferred. This is sort of a thin legal argument, and it often doesn't work. But um, the beginning of that film, they actually had this title card that said, like, this is a true story. And there are people around who are still alive that experienced this. And the judge specifically pointed this out of, like, yeah, this is what got you this judgment. <laughs> <laughs> so now they do the exact opposite. All right, thanks a lot. I'll see you next time. That's right, Zoe. Ahmed Ziad Turk, Alicia Bramble, Casey Mustia, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, Kyle Murgatroyd, and O'Reels One are fantastic legendary patrons.